And a hearty welcome to one and all. This is episode 193 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for spending some of your happy hump day with me here in New York. If you check out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, enjoy it. Please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platform such as Spotify or iTunes, click like, subscribe, share, turn on those notifications. So today is the 27th anniversary of the release date of the franchise starter, Mission Impossible. Now, Mission Impossible is in a little bit of a weird spot historically. Uh, as many of you know, we recently had the 25th anniversary of Star, uh, Star Trek, Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, was released um, earlier in May, but 1999, so three years later. But... Star Wars Episode One: Phantom Menace, society, technology had advanced enough where the preview trailer for Phantom Menace had been downloaded, downloaded, downloaded. A shit ton of people saw it, even though YouTube was years away. A lot of people illegally, I think it was illegally, downloaded the trailer for Phantom Menace. And then they were disappointed in the movie. George Lucas destroyed my childhood. Fuck George Lucas. George Lucas is the worst person in history, etc., etc., etc. When Mission Impossible came out, and even before that, uh, if memory serves, the teaser trailer for Mission Impossible 1 hit theaters in late 1995. I am almost 100% certain that when I went to the cinemas to see the pretty bad, even though I love the actors, Woody Harrelson, Wesley Snipes, and in her film debut, Jennifer Lopez, Money Train. I'm pretty sure that while I was sitting there getting ready for Money Train, the teaser trailer for Mission Impossible, that's where I saw it for the first time. Mission Impossible, the teaser, got people Super excited. Now, Tom Cruise had been in Interview with the Vampire. He had worked steadily. He did The Firm. He had done A Few Good Men. And the same year of A Few Good Men, he did a, not a good movie, Far and Away, Ron Howard, one of his few failures, in my opinion. But he was working, and he did Interview with the Vampire, which had to be a very arduous and difficult shoot. And then he seemed to disappear for a while. He didn't really disappear. He was working his tail off. And late 1995, all of a sudden, we got a trailer for the first Mission Impossible. And so many people, whether or not they were on the internet, people were talking, buzz, word of mouth, before the movie was even coming out. Now, me as a film geek, when I saw that Brian De Palma had directed it, I was shocked, absolutely shocked that De Palma was chosen to direct it. And then there were reports coming out of the set uh, because Tom Cruise and his producing partner, Paula Wagner, were the key people, the kind of point men, point men, point woman, for the film. Cruise was looking to not spend as much. Proportionally speaking, the later Mission Impossible films, they had the advantage of being a successful series and escalating budgets, but in the first film, Crews just wanted to see that they could do it. And if you know the later movies and somehow haven't seen the first one, the first one is not really that big of a budget. It's more classic spy thriller stuff than action thriller extravaganza, shit blowing up real good, Tom Cruise doing a stunt that probably cost $3 million, and we're lucky that we didn't have to give the man last rights any number of times. But Mission Impossible, because it came out in 96, the internet existed. I wasn't on yet, but most of my film geek friends had Earthlink or Mindspring. They had email addresses. But I don't know that there was enough bandwidth for this to be streamed on the internet in 1996. And if it could be streamed, it didn't look particularly good. It was... You, you weren't going to get very much back then. So in order to see the trailer, in the overwhelming percentage of cases, I'm sure there were some techies and some, um, now they would be IT people, who figured out how to stream it. But I didn't know a single person 
that watched that trailer teaser anywhere but in a movie theater. So that's a product of its time. Because a few years before that, there was no internet anyway. And this sort of conversation this isn't something that we would think of. If you're under 30, these are not things you've ever had to ponder. And as somebody who watched the computer age burgeoning and then exploding, and then what the hell is the internet, and go from there. So the buzz on, it, uh, on Mission Impossible was that it was good, that it was a good movie. Um, and I don't mean internet buzz. I don't think that Harry Knowles and Ain't It Cool News had launched, or if they had launched, they had just launched. I know one of the first reviews that they did was Broken Arrow, which came out right around the same time. That was the John Woo film with um, John Travolta and um, Christian Slater and Howie Long, the football player, among others. But the buzz was good. No one had seen it, but the trailer hit you with a lot of different set pieces. And this is something that I was always paying attention to in movie trailers of the day. And another summer 1996 film, which I saw the trailer repeatedly every time I went to the movies, was Arnold Schwarzenegger's Eraser. In the kind of Arnold Schwarzenegger filmography, Eraser is probably the least discussed big hit of his career because it pulled in well over $100 million. It's okay. But I remember watching that trailer and calculating how many action set pieces there were just based on what we saw. What I liked about the Mission Impossible trailer, it doesn't really give anything away. It doesn't give away any plot. All we know is we hear the music, and I, I didn't really watch the TV show. It was before my time. But the music is catchy. And, oh, John Voight, you know, he was great in a number of movies in the 90s. As the 90s went forward, he had The Rainmaker, Matt Damon. He knocks it out of the park. Enemy of the State, Will Smith, fucking great. And obviously Anaconda with Jennifer Lopez, The Wink. Greatest wink in cinematic history. John Voight, after getting eaten by her snake, snake spits him out. He winks at Jennifer Lopez, who screams. And audiences everywhere lost their shit laughing. It, it, I don't know that it was. It normally would be funny, but in a world of that film, people told me before I saw Anaconda, John Voight, at a certain point in the movie, is going to wink, and you were going to scream with laughter, and that's exactly what happened. So when I saw that Voight was in Mission Impossible, oh, he's playing Jim Phelps. Okay, terrific. So the trailer doesn't really give anything away other than, okay, there's a big action sequence where he's going to get blown on top of a train somehow by a, by a bomb. I don't even know what it is. And there's another enormous action sequence where he appears to be escaping through glass and water. That's what sold it for me. I had never seen anything that looked like that. That Cruz is basically running away from exploding glass and water. That was sort of the money shot of the trailer, at least for me. And the buzz was so strong that lines were around the block. The opening weekend, Mission Impossible, I saw a matinee. I went to the movies at Sunrise Mall, a theater which is really long gone. It's been closed since 1998. Um, and it was starting to kind of struggle, but the movie theaters were still doing big business. But that was a, a place that did morning Screenings, morning matinees. I went to a morning screening of Mission Impossible 1. I had just finished my coursework for the spring 1996 semester. And I was gambling, so to speak, that I was going to be able to get in, and I did. The theater was like half full. They didn't have any huge theaters. It was like uh, an eightplex at the Sunrise Mall. Now, I had read reviews. Reviews were no critic that I saw unabashedly loved it but I didn't see any real trash reviews. My perception was if there was a Rotten Tomatoes back then, it would have gotten about a 70%. The first time seeing the movie on the big screen, I, I loved it. Absolutely loved it, no reservations, even though I didn't really understand a lot of what was going on. And the late great uh, author and screenwriter, Princess Bride, All the President's Men, uh, William Goldman, Marathon Man, that was also him, one of my favorite movies, and a phenomenal book. Goldman uh, did the last draft of the Mission Impossible script, and when he talked about it, he said that the producers, not Cruz, but the other people involved, they wanted him to add as much um, kind of technical lingo or lingo that would be used by people in the Impossible Missions Force 
and he referred to it as CIA gobbledygook. He said, I feel like I use too much CIA gobbledygook and I confuse people and I don't think we needed to. So what I didn't get, and this isn't really a spoiler, the first time through the movie, I didn't understand that that entire opening mission was basically a sham. It was a joke. And all of this stuff with a knock list and this guy's got the list and that guy and I didn't really, I wasn't following it entirely. I knew that people on his team got killed for real, but there was a lot of stuff and a lot of turns of plot that I didn't get until I saw the movie again. And then, okay, Mission Impossible presents itself as an impenetrably dense, labyrinthine, serpentine plot on first viewing. Watch it again, and it's actually very simple. It's not, it's not complicated at all. But the first time through, if you've never seen it, you're probably going to be scratching your head wondering, well, I don't understand. So they're not really dead. Yes, they are dead. Sorry, that's a spoiler. But all of the craziness in the story, in the plot. And, you know, Ethan Hunt, Tom Cruise's character, is not as... He's not funny in this film. And one of the things that they were able to do in the later movies, and I thought Dead Reckoning was incredible, and I thought Fallout was fantastic. Really, every Mission Impossible film, the second one is just okay. They tried to mirror, um, as dumb as this sounds, the Alfred Hitchcock film Notorious. That was what they were going for. Let's remake Notorious, because in that movie had um, Cary Grant, Ingrid Bergman, they're in love, but she's fucking around with this other guy, and, well, it's for country, yeah, okay, okay, whatever you say. Um, they wanted to do that, but hang like four or five big action scenes around it, and that's Mission Impossible 2. It's not as good as the first one. I think it's the weakest film in the entire series. But the idea is that the later films, Ethan Hunt, despite being dangerous and seeming to almost have some kind of otherworldly powers of deduction, and the fact that He's been in so many life or death situations, and if he gets a, a, a bug bite, it's a lot. He just usually comes off without a scratch. And I forgot which movie it was, but but um, the Alec Baldwin character, he kind of hints at the fact that there's something wrong with this guy, that he never, he just, nothing ever happens to him. He just delivers the goods in every way. But the character of Hunt has a sense of humor from, let's say, the third film, okay, maybe the fourth film, Forward that there is a little bit of a twinkle in his eye. He doesn't have any of that in the first film. They weren't sure if Cruz playing that sort of character was going to play. And up to that point in his career, he played the cocksure type character, yes. He had done that in Top Gun, in Cocktail, in Days of Thunder. But that's not what they were going for here. And that's not what you see in the later Mission Impossible movies either. But it's a tightly controlled performance. What Cruz does in the first Mission Impossible, he sells the spy skullduggery stuff. From a certain point of view, his character is an American James Bond. You don't get that in the later movies. He's part of a team, not IMF, but the group, the team with, uh, you know, the Simon Pegg character and, and Rebecca Ferguson, and obviously Ving Rhames, who is in this first movie and is really, really good. He kind of gave a little bit away. I read an interview with Ving. Now, I had been a fan of Ving Rhames since seeing him in Dave, uh, which I've discussed frequently on the channel because of Kevin Klein's incredible performance. But my dad and I both, when we saw Dave, we became Ving Rhames fans just by how incredible he is in that movie, balancing the kind of serious with the funny. But Cruz's performance is tight. It's focused. The scenes that he has with Henry Sherney as uh, Kittredge, gold. The scenes that he has with John Voight as Phelps, also great. The fact that they were able to get Jean Reno, who only recently had done uh, Leon or The Professional, if you prefer, or you can just call it Leon The Professional, top 10 all-time great action movies, Leon The Professional. Getting Jean Reno for the part that he played was a master stroke. And I don't know how they did it, because Jean Reno at that point was still working mostly overseas. And the thing with Leon The Professional, it's a bit of an outlier in that it's a movie that was funded by European money to an enormous extent. It was a European film that was opened in Europe. The uncut, unrated version is a lot dirtier than what we saw, and we saw a pretty dirty film too. But the stuff with Natalie Portman and Jean Reno, 
No thank you. There's a lot more of that in the European version. But the film's set in New York City. That's something that you don't see very often in. Can't even think of another movie where it's almost all European money made by a European filmmaker. But you got Danny Aiello, American in the cast, and Natalie Portman in her film debut, Gary Oldman, etc., etc. But Jean Reno plays a very critical character of Krieger in Mission Impossible. And he, when he's in it, he keeps the film grounded because his character is very serious. There is no lightness in his step. He is keeping the film here. If anybody wants to go up here, he's bringing it back down. And the most famous scene in the film is one which still plays. And it's the sort of thing that is so difficult, even conceptually, to understand. An action scene that is edge of your seat, almost literally heart-stopping, heart-rending, hair-raising, but not big budget. They were able to do this, this isn't really a spoiler, a sequence where Ethan Hunt and his team, including John Reno's character, with the, with the help of Ving Rhames, try to break into CIA headquarters. Well, they, breaking in is not really that big of a deal. They're able to do that. But get into a particular office of a particular guy named William Donlow. And the actor who played Donlow, I don't know who he is, but man, was he good. But they need to get into a particular office and do a particular thing on the computer of this particular gentleman named William Donlow, who is an analyst and presumably very intelligent. So you have Tom Cruise and Jean Reno. And this is something where Brian De Palma, the filmmaker, was able to stretch. And if you didn't know that this film had a more limited budget, proportionally speaking, uh, in terms of inflation and the era in which it was made, you wouldn't automatically say, oh yeah, it was a way smaller budget relative even uh, time value of money kind of stuff. Way small, no. When we think of that sequence, our first thought isn't, oh, that didn't cost any money to shoot. It doesn't even, it's not even part of the thought process. We just remember that scene is incredible. Cruz's facial expressions, a moment where a bead of sweat, if a bead of sweat drips to the floor, they are all fucked. Reach it out, catch the bead of sweat. Scenes like that, that make the movie work. Even though, as I say, we believe this is this labyrinthine, serpentine, contorted, twisted plot, and it really isn't. It's very simple and straightforward. And Vanessa Redgrave, who plays... Uh, She's kind of a bad, a bad actor, as they say. In the world of the film, she is not one of the good guys. She's fantastic. And I remember there was a lot of buzz around her performance, not so much from the Oscar perspective, but because that's not a role that she normally would have played. And it was very inspired casting. Because if you learn of an internet presence and Tom Cruise's character, he has email. And I remember seeing it at the time and I was still a year and a half away from getting my first email address, but I thought all of this stuff was really cool. He's communicating with a presence that he knows is somewhat notorious and it turns out it's Vanessa Redgrave. And we see the some of the crew's um, the focus and the ability to balance the occasional moments of levity with moments of being serious. And there's a scene where he is explaining to the character Vanessa Redgrave, who I think goes by Max, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe Maxine, we don't know. And it keeps looking like she's just going to bump him off. But he knows that she isn't because the information that they are trying to access, he is telling them, you're not going to be able to do this. In about two minutes, what did he say? A bunch of Virginia farm boys are going to come bursting down your door. And she thinks he's full of shit, that he's bluffing. He ain't bluffing. And he knows he's not bluffing. It's not complicated. But the twists of plot in the third act, a lot of people took issue with, and I'm not going to spoil it, I'm not going to go any further, there are events and circumstances that take place in the third act, which a lot of people who were fans of the TV show or even just aware of the TV show felt were not okay or this is totally against the point of the TV show. But hey, 
invention is important. You can't just repeat stuff. And one of the movies I've uh, discussed on the channel a few times, Barry Levinson's baseball fable, The Natural, if we apply the same logic, the whole point of the book, the reason for being, the book's reason for being was to show no matter how much natural talent you have, you're going to be a fucking loser if you lack character. The movie is saying, if you have an enormous amount of talent, you just need a little bit of character and you're going to be fine. Totally inverted the point of the book. The book was pessimistic, sarcastic. The book was almost anti-baseball because there was so much corruption. It was an angry book by an author who was pissed off in Bernard Malamud. So when you take a TV show and you spin a TV show into a movie, there are no sacred cows. You make the best movie you can. And John Voight brings it. He's great in a, a pretty limited role. There's a, a little bit of like uh, Sharon Stone in Total Recall, although this is not sci-fi. But Sharon Stone in Total Recall, if we revisit that movie, as I like to every now and again, but if we revisit that movie and haven't seen it in a really long time, you will be surprised, well, maybe not now because I'm telling you this, she is absent for a, a huge chunk of the film. And the way that memory works, when I saw the movie in 2020, I, 2019, excuse me, it was before COVID, I watched it on Netflix, and I hadn't seen it in at least 10 years, maybe more. I had forgotten that she disappears for a pretty significant chunk of the film and then shows up again. In the original Mission Impossible, John Voight's Jim, uh, Jim Phelps is absent for a large chunk of the narrative. And it's not something that we would necessarily think of when we're watching the movie and the team is together at the beginning and all of that, all of that kind of stuff. But without going into spoilers, there are a lot of threats made. There are, there's a lot of daring do, and there's still a lot of big action sequences just executed at the sort of street level and during production. When Tom Cruise escapes that crazy explosion with the glass and the water, it's really Tom Cruise running towards the camera. I don't know that they would have let too many other actors perform that stunt. Wesley Snipes, in a movie I just mentioned, Money Train, he did a stunt on a subway uh, on subway tracks in New York City. He wanted to do he wanted to do it in an even more dangerous way, and the studio said, "No, we know you're a great athlete, but this is not. We can't let you do this." But Tom Cruise, in the first Mission Impossible, as already a producer. You know, Tom was 30, 32, 33 at the time this film was in production. He was already pretty much the top of the Hollywood mountain. He was able to say, no, I'm doing this. The studio can, can go to hell. We're making a movie here, and there's no internet. They're not sending dailies back by the day. I'm doing this stunt one way or the other. No, thing. we don't need to tell them what we're doing. We're just doing it. You know, it's like the scene in the trailer, in the, the full trailer, where... Ving Rhames and Jean Reno and Emmanuel Baer, who plays um, Jim Phelps' wife in the movie, where they can't believe what Cruz's plan is. And he just goes, we're going to do it with that smile. And the smile in the full trailer was another reason why people couldn't wait to get to the theater, because the Cruz smile, it's a big part of his persona. But in this movie, he doesn't flash it that much in this movie. People expecting a fun ride, they got it, but it's not as light as people probably expected. Based on Cruz's track record of the number of movies he had made just to that point, hell, even A Few Good Men, he has moments where he flashes the smile, as much as that's a pretty serious film. But without spoiling it, it does set up infinite possibilities for sequels, and we've seen it, and establishes Ethan Hunt as somebody who is very devoted and dedicated and who believes in the kind of old school ethos of, I'm gonna to try to put country first. He doesn't act in his own best interest at all in this film. You know, they threaten members of his family and he, fuck you, you know, what are you kidding me? Oh, you better do this or... But he does have that edge. He has that angry edge to him at various points in the film. 
and he plays it, he plays it very well. There were reports, though, that he and De Palma had some issues, but Cruz always talked about how much he loved Brian as a filmmaker, and looking back on it, that he was the right guy for this particular film. In part, De Palma was known as a wizard when it came to figuring out how to stage scenes, not even action sequences necessarily, but sometimes, yes. But Cruz would say he was the right guy because he's somebody that knew how to maximize the camera and give us the maximum bang for the buck. So if I told him, and you can find interviews where Cruz discusses this, we can only spend X number of dollars on this scene. He knew how to do it. So Cruz having conversations like that with De Palma, it doesn't mean they were butting heads. It's part of the creative process. You don't always have an unlimited budget. And I even just read a story where Steven Spielberg, who was an executive producer on the movie um, Casper, which came out the summer before, where he actually had to talk to Bill Pullman. There was a big special effects sequence, and he said, Bill, you're going to bankrupt this production if you keep fucking this up. You got to get this right. And well, he didn't actually say if you keep fucking this up, but the idea was even somebody like Spielberg at that point had people to answer to. And nobody's looking to throw 100000 out of their own pocket needlessly. Sometimes it just ends up working out that way. Sylvester Stallone in Cliffhanger, three summers earlier, there was a, a plane-to-plane air transfer that the studio wouldn't fund. Sly kicked in probably a million dollars of his fee because he felt it was that important to the movie's success. Cruz was committed to making the best possible first film in a hopeful franchise of Mission Impossible. And even though a lot of people uh, liked it, they didn't love it. And I, I feel like I was almost in the minority. I would have given the film a, a huge score because I just thought it was so well done, so well shot and well orchestrated. And especially the second time when I realized, okay, it's not nearly as, as twisty as I thought it was. It's more straightforward, a straightforward spy thriller kind of thing. The movie grossed $458 million worldwide which is, it would be a big number now, but you do, the, you do the math, as I always say, at a time value of money, that's probably 800 million now, maybe more. So it was a massive runaway success, and the first sequel came out in 2000. Now, the interesting thing, from the Tom Cruise perspective, is he didn't make that many movies between one and the other, because he was busy. He did Jerry Maguire, and he did... Oh, that came out later. He shot Jerry Maguire right after finishing work, like within probably a month or so, finishing work on Mission Impossible. But then as he was promoting Jerry Maguire in the fall of 1996, he started shooting Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut. That's why there are no Tom Cruise movies in 19, 1997, 1998. He was busy working on Eyes Wide Shut, presumably doing 300 takes for every setup and never complaining because he was so geeked and so devoted to making the best possible movie he could with Stanley Kubrick, one of his heroes, one of his idols. And Nicole Kidman, same thing. But the first Mission Impossible, which is available, um, I think it's streaming on Paramount+. Plus. I, I could be wrong. I know that it's free on streaming. It might be free on multiple platforms at this point. But if you haven't seen it, just see it. Even if the technology is a little bit weak, with characters talking about 586 prototypes, microprocessors. I mean, it's pretty dated. But as a spy film, pretend it's a standalone spy thriller. It's really good. It's a lot better than most of what you would see today. And Cruz at the center, it's never going to be an Oscar type of a performance, but he's tight and focused and into it. And you can see him giving everything he's got. He doesn't take any scenes off. And the rest of the cast, uh, the main cast, Voight and Ving Rhames, Kristen Scott Thomas, Emilio Estevez in small roles, everybody gives what they've got. And I think, if anything, the film to me has, it's gotten better over time because the series has been so successful and that's the franchise starter. Mission Impossible, released on this day, 1996, directed by one of my favorites, Brian De Palma, starring Tom Cruise, John Voight, Ving Rhames, Kristen Scott Thomas, Emilio Estevez, Emmanuel Baer, and as Kittredge, fantastic Henry Sherney. This has been episode 193 
of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for spending some of your Wednesday evening here with me in New York. If you caught this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platforms such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, and turn on those notifications. I'll be back with episode 194 real, real soon. Till then, peace. Thank you.